Yep. Hello, hello, hello. How we doing? Swell and tired. That was the conference. Epic. <laughs> uh, conference was good. The, uh, so it was a Google conference, and the interesting things I got out of it were that there's a lot of interesting things being done with um, Markdown and Google Slides and all that kind of fun stuff. It's mostly like faculty oriented. Um, and somebody demoed, I threw it in the uh, the Discord chat, but there is that really interesting microservices game. Um, I thought that was kind of cool. Basically build a microservice and attack each other with, I think, leaves. <laughs> and they grabbed your GitHub profile picture as your, your avatar. That was good. How was not being in class on Friday? Productive. Ooh, I like that. We will probably do that again in October at some point. I don't remember when I woke up this morning. <laughs> nice. Um, I've got a different one to go to in early October, middle of October, something like that. Um, but... The, so one of the things that's kind of neat about that, so I, I go to that, the one that I went to on Friday every year, and we'll talk about this at some point in the near future, but if any of you need a place to host something like websites, um, or if you want to use any of the really cool products that Google has, so there's um, <clears throat> like you, you can go through the entire GitHub data set in seconds, or you can use their Translate API or their maps or something. I'll have like a little, um, like a little lab write up type of thing at, at some point if, uh, if we get to that. But basically, you can use Google Cloud for free all semester. So if that's something that you're interested in using early, let me know and I can get you set up. Otherwise, we'll probably do something when we have a little bit more time later on um, it's it's got some pretty neat stuff like uh, let me show you um, quickly uh, ed you can't type today Basically, the point of this, and I'm not really trying to spend a whole lot of time on this right now, but there are a whole ton of things that you can do up on their site, and this is not what I want to 
This is all of their fun stuff. Let me... Oh, that should be something like that. Really? Console.cloud, not cloud.console. Um, basically, you get free credits for this through a program that I'm a part of. And I use it mainly for like virtual machines or cloud functions, which are like AWS Lambda functions, if you're familiar with that. But you can build um, apps. You can do Kubernetes, so like Kubernetes and Docker. Uh, Compute Engine is like virtual machines. Um, there's a whole bunch of IoT or machine learning or TensorFlow or a whole bunch of interesting things that are up there. Um, I tend to use it more like virtual machines in the classroom, but if there is something that you're all interested in, I know I can't find the, they've got like a nice big long table of what you can do with it. Here we go. Um, and yeah, so analytics, IoT, AI, auto ML is kind of cool. It's machine learning without having to write models yourself. Speech to text, text to speech, whole bunch of neat things. Um, I've had students in the past, like one of them built a little robotic hand out of cardboard, <laughs> um, and he was going to plug it into the Vision API to do like image recognition to figure out what you're looking at, kind of things. Uh, not strictly relevant or required for our class. More would be something like a supporting thing if you wanted extra resources for your project. Um, I didn't really have anything prepared for that. Just kind of wanted to show you what I was doing while I was away. But so we had the meeting minutes due last night. How did that go for everybody? It's your first time having to do that. I saw lots of meetings going on in the Discord channel during class, so that's good. Good, good. I didn't read through them yet, but I just kind of skimming through all your chats. It's uh, DDoS, absolutely fantastic. Um, DDoS? I'm not sure what your question is there. You can get DDoS protection. Yeah, sure. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I, honestly, the point of that one was to get you all kind of thinking about what you want to be doing. Never mind, that was just me. I'm noticing I've got some dropped frames going on my side, so hopefully my internet's not acting up too badly. Um, but yeah, so start holding your weekly meetings, and um, I'll start moving our project forward. So the kind of the big thing is to get you all thinking about that project proposal. Um, that's basically going to form the skeleton of your final report. So it'll be an iterative process, but if you can try and get some ideas kind of out there right now, that would be, be a good thing. And I'll give you feedback based on your meeting minutes that you turned in. So if you're shooting a little bit too high, <laughs> I'll let you know, and we can work on scaling it back. And if you're not doing enough, um, I will also let you know. Again, I promised if you had a large team and you were doing something pretty trivial, then uh, I would let you know about that. So definitely look for feedback. I will get that back to you shortly. But I will say this. Good job um, you know, holding your meetings and getting going and, and kind of taking it seriously. It definitely good to see all of the chatter in, in the channel and hopefully a little bit of excitement. And I'm, I'm kind of excited to see what you all come up with. Alrighty, so enough intro stuff. Let's talk about our next phase. So before we went into kind of the classical models of software engineering and software processes, this week we're going to talk about configuration management. This is actually a nice little segue because you've been all doing Git-related stuff, right? So you've hopefully started looking at the homework that's due the 29th. So coming up here in eight days, um, that is a part of configuration management. Today, we're going to look at the classic view. So this is not strictly Git, what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to talk about that next time. Um, we're going to look at the kind of the other side of things. So if you any of you have ever 
heard of Subversion or SVN for short, or any of the other uh, source code management tools that are out there. They have a slightly different take on it than Git does. Um, Git does it in a more distributed way to give you the preview. So we'll talk about that today, and then next time we'll go into the more modern side. Our Git demo will probably be a little bit more limited since you've all, you know, I, I've been giving it to you early, basically, so that you can all get up and running with your projects. But that's kind of the plan for this week, anyway. So let's start off with a slidey poll. So how many of you out there have used some kind of source repository or source control system <coughs> uh, so far? And if you haven't started the homework, that's fine. Your answer can be can be no for that one. I'm just kind of curious, and I'm going to participate as well, since I want to make sure the poll works. <coughs> hey, look at that. One person. Awesome. It does work. I'm still waiting. All right, good. What's source control? Hey! That's what we're going to talk about today. I need to pay for the uh, the pro version so I can get little fancy Twitch things floating around the screen from this polling software. Okay. Answers are coming in hot. So by the end of our first lab, everybody should be saying yes. Let me put it that way. V420, was that intentional? No, it's, uh, I guess that's just how today's going to be. Um, I get a, a randomly generated number. But it's 821, so we're a little bit off from that. Not 420. Anyway, so yes, no, what's source control? So. Anybody in the chat maybe want to describe what source control is? This is where I'd ask somebody in class, what is source control? Anybody? Or this is the joke answer, I'm not sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll take this as the legitimate question, what is it? So source control is what you're basically doing for your first lab, your first assignment. GitHub, an element of software engineering. Is there a bit of a delay with my stream today, possibly? No, I'm getting so many dropped frames. I'm not doing anything on my computer. Track manage the code, yes. So I, I've been talking about Git sporadically throughout our various classes just to get you used to it, right? This is where you take source code. You remember we add it, we commit it, we push it. So this is part of source control, basically. You are managing versions of your code base, OK? So you have basically a snapshot in time as you do your development procedures. I have my code. You know, I write my Hello World program. Uh, I add all the features I need to take it from Hello World to full functioning web application or something like that. And then I check it in to my source control. And then I have a version for that particular point in time. It's, it's basically the same thing. So yeah, it, version control, source control, the same names here. So we are basically just having snapshots that we can go back to later on if we need to. All right, so 57% of you have at least started the lab, I guess, is kind of the, the cheeky takeaway here. We have been only talking about Git or source control or revision control, version control, in terms of source code so far. All right, you're checking in your Java files, your Python files, your readmes, things of that nature, right? So we don't need to use it just for source code. We can use it for anything. And it's actually encouraged to check everything into your revision control system. 
Okay. So let's let's pretend for a moment that you're working in a Git environment. Um, you're going to check in your source code into your repositories. You're also going to check in your artifacts, your documents. You'll have different versions with that. This gives you not only like checkpoints in time for when a particular document was created, but it also gives you redundancy, right? So it's not just on your computer. Anybody can check it out and pull it down at any point in time, right? They don't need to go to you, uh, the engineer in cubicle 4A or whatever. Um, hey, I need this document. They just go to your repository and pull it down, right? Or I want everything related to this particular milestone or this particular release candidate or this particular time frame, right? Everything will be neatly and nicely organized. So the point is that with this, um, this notion of configuration management, this is all part and parcel of a, it's like the backbone of the software engineering process, I suppose. So last time we talked about all the different processes, right? Waterfall, V model, agile, these are all supported by revision control or configuration management. So here is a very pixelated, blurry picture um, that I linked off of Wikipedia, and it's from the DoD. This is one view of configuration management, and it's a very, very busy figure, obviously, right? The point is not necessary to, to memorize every single line, every single arrow. But here are some of the different activities that go into configuration management. And so you almost, if you look at this from a very high level, you have kind of a waterfall type of um, gradient here, right? So we start out management and planning. We kind of delve down into the various activities, getting more and more detailed as we go. But instead of here being, you know, uh, initial system design and getting into program design and, and uh, development and maintenance and release and all of that. Here you're looking at things like project management, figuring out your configuration system, developing a control system. And all of these lines are more logistical. They're more systems engineering level, right? So here we have guides for training. Here we have what resources and facilities we need. Here we have OK, here's your requirements, but maybe functional analysis. Maybe we're going to have feasibility studies. Everything that we need to support a project that's not source code is going to be probably in this kind of an area. right? So the different documentations and artifacts that you're going to need to actually build a real world project. right? So the point is not that you know configuration management is necessarily just checking in source code. It's managing the whole, whole shebang, right? The whole project. So this is just to show you how impressive the process is. It's not, again, don't memorize this figure. I like a more simplified view of things. And this is another one um, that's very high level, but it gives you the, the idea of what we're going to be doing with config, uh, configuration management. So we're going to do our planning and our specs. What is planning? Well, planning is figuring out what we need for the project. It's staffing. It's figuring out what modules we need. Uh, again, planning out initial requirements, things that happen at the very beginning, right? Then you go into your analysis and design, implementation, testing, release, maintenance. So all these things that we've talked about so far are all supported by this configuration management kind of pillar in a way. Again, not just implementation, all your test cases, all your releases. If we go back to our GitHub repo that we have for all of you, and if you haven't checked this out, I suggest you do soon so that you can get rid of any headaches you might have. This is a very simplified view of a project configuration management system, right? So source code is one folder. Here's where you're going to put all your software tests. Here's where you're putting your meeting minutes. All of your artifacts will go in here. All your documentation will go in here. Very, very simplified, <clears throat> but we have the history and we have ways to kind of manage our project this way. Depending on how crazy we go this semester, we might even go into issue tracking or change management with this, right? You can actually do that in GitHub and Git. Um, like I can create project cards if you want to go a little bit more agile route. This is something that's feasible in here where here's my to-dos, here's my in-progresses, here's my done. 
So that's your the lines on your whiteboard of your post-it notes. So we can replicate that in, in GitHub as well. So this all goes into configuration management. And the kind of the takeaway for all of you for this is that you want to be consistent. This is a, a nice keyword. I've got it in bold, nice shade of green font. Um, consistency is key for a project. And that's why we have the processes that we talked about last time. That's why we have the underpinning support of a configuration management system. All right, so let's say that we are done with project A or project X, more interesting letter. We release it, customer's happy, and then we have to go into the next one. We're going to follow the same process, you know, assuming that's going to fit, but we're also going to have the same configuration management system underneath. So we're going to go through the same checkpoints to make sure that we have our releases in order. We're going to go through the same artifact development procedures and things of that nature. So being consistent is usually a very good idea, right? You want a good product here. All right, so config, I'm, I'm just going to keep saying config and then realize I should say configuration to spell the whole thing out. What are we actually doing under the hood? So configuration management in terms of development is basically going to be effectively that process that I showed you with Git in that that write-up with that little too long Git and read. That's kind of what we're doing here. Git files and sets of files. All right, so we want to grab something out of the repo, right? Might be one file, might be a set of files. And what's a file? It could be source code. It could be a document. It could be a binary file. I mean, you can put anything under revision control. That's kind of the nice thing about it, right? We also can unlock and lock files. Now, that's a good question for you all. Hopefully, you have gotten some of this already. Um, if you've taken an operating systems class, you probably have a, a head start on this question. But why would you lock a file? So let's say that I am a developer. I want to check out a file to work on it. First step that happens is that it gets locked. Why would I lock something? This is a very important concept in computer science. So curious what your thoughts are. Prevent others from modifying it. Yep, that's definitely a big chunk of it. What happens when we two people modify the same file at the same time? We lose progress. Bad. Yes. A beautiful con... Ooh, I like that. A beautiful conflict. <coughs> Introduce bugs. Um, it depends on the system. So it's a slightly open-ended question, but the, the, the byline is that bad things happen. Right? So depending on how your system is structured, we might not know what's going to happen. If you and I both check out the file at the same time and we're working on it and it doesn't get locked, depending on you know who checks in what first we might get garbled text we might get a crashed system and it just depends right we don't really know what the output will be i'm sure there is guards on on things to make sure that that doesn't happen but that's why we lock files right so if you're using a traditional source code repository system or a revision control system i want to work on this particular c file or this particular java file i would check it out you see a little lock icon perhaps pop up, pop up in your, your tool. Everybody else will see that too, and then they understand that they can't actually pull that down and work on it until you've checked it back in. Or they would work on a local copy, and they couldn't push their changes up until you've unlocked it, basically, right? So this prevents race conditions, this consistency. Again, that's the keyword here. All right, checking in files. This is basically your commit that we've been talking about so far. Uh, the thing you're going to notice, too, is that when you go from the standard to the more distributed version, like Git standard being more like an SVN, the names are going to change slightly, but the idea is going to be the same. OK, so a commit is basically the same as a check-in. You know, there's differences under the hood, obviously, but the concept is the same. You're pushing your changes up with a version number. Uh, we also can do things like tagging and baselining. 
so tagging more of a git thing baselining more of a svn traditional type of thing basically you're creating a point in time so what is the snapshot of all your files for this baseline or this tag okay so this is release candidate 1.1 1 .1. File A is version 1, file 2 is, ver is version 2.1.1, depending on how it works, right? So this is basically giving you a nice little human readable notion of your, your point in history here. Then we branch and merge. So we'll talk about this as well. Um, this is where we create separate branches in our development tree. Typically, you have a trunk. So think of this like an actual tree, right? So the main trunk is your main source code, right? This is your your base. Maybe you want to go explore another feature or you want to try something out, you make a branch. Okay, so then I have a development branch going off another way. Issue is that if once you branch, you have to make sure that you reflect all the mainline changes into your branch as you go, you know, if that's something that you need. And then merging, we'll talk about as well, this is where you bring things back to your mainline. Uh, one thing that I should mention too, before we get too far, is that this applies again to one file or sets of files. So this doesn't just have to be, you know, your readme file. This could be your readme plus all of your source code, plus all of your assets, plus all your documents. This all features in here. Stack time. Um, all right, so here is a visual view of these things that we've been talking about so far. So. Again, this could be an individual file. This could be a set of files here. So let's say that I have a particular file, the very boringly named file A. You could call this main.c or main.java or hello.py or whatever you want to call it, right? This file, we don't care what its type is. We don't care what it comprises. We just know that this is some object with a version. All right, so this v is version, x is the number. Uh, in a traditional development uh, config management system, these are auto, like auto incremented kind of things. So this would be like version 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Git gets a little bit crazy with um, like those long GUID type of identifiers where it's kind of hard to know what which commit is which, actually. So here's the process. You have a file. I want to work on it. Okay, my job for the day is to update this file. First thing I need to do is get access to it. Now, if it's locked, I can't get access, right? I can pull down a read-only copy of it, but I can't edit it and, ch and make the ch or I, I can edit it, but I can't make the changes into our system until it's unlocked, right? So once I get access, I'm going to lock it for myself. It's going to be tagged with my user ID. I'm the only one that can change this thing, right? So I'm going to lock it. I'll introduce my changes, and then I will check in a new version, which means that the version number is going to get incremented in some way, and then we unlock it for everybody else to use. Pretty straightforward process. And the key thing here is we have to make sure that we have access to it. One thing you may or may not have heard of is the notion of a sandbox for software development. So typically what you would have is a local folder structure with all of your so I'm, I'm going to talk about this in terms of source code, but this also is documents and all that too, right? I'll have a project folder on my computer. I might check out a version out of my configuration management system, right? When you did a git clone, you're basically doing something very similar. I have this on my computer. I'm going to make all my changes locally. Once I'm ready to push my changes up, I have to lock the files introduce my changes, and then check them in. All right, there are some key differences between Git and what we're doing here. Again, this is more traditional. We'll, we'll talk about that next time. But, you know, typically you'll have something on your computer to play with. And again, if something's locked, you can get a read-only copy to work on it in parallel. <clears throat> you just have to make sure that you bring your changes in. Now, what makes this a special system? Why is this not just something simple like check out, check in? Sometimes you need to file issues or have some kind of a change authorization. So the next slide is basically just this blown up um, and change authorization is pushed in here. So I'm just going to talk about this one right now. 
exact same view. The only difference here is this change authorization. All right. So when you have a project, typically you're going to have a list of issues that you need to work on. All right. So these are going to be bite sized pieces of your project. Generally, they'll tie to some requirements or they'll tie to some feature or some use case, you know, whatever your artifacts are. You'll have this link to it, right? So I am working on my web application today. So this is project W for web app creativity is not here today, apparently. Project W, I want to work on the user login system. So I have to introduce a login form for the login form. I need validation on all my fields, right? Username has to be a particular format, password, clearly, you know, plain text, five characters, you know, only lowercase letters, right? That's all we need. No, just kidding. Obviously make it a very complicated password, but we have to validate this form. Okay. That's our job for today. So I, what I'm going to do as a developer, I'm going to go to my source code repo. I'm going to pull down login.html, login.php, you know, login.aspx, whatever the file is you're working on. I'm going to pull it down. I'm going to get a lock. I'm going to make my changes, and I'm going to check to make sure everything works OK, right? So I've got my little local system I'm trying everything out on. This point here, this change authorization, and this goes to the notion of like change management, slightly different phrasing from configuration management. I need some kind of an issue to check this back in on. So in GitHub, you may have heard of something called a pull request. Sorry, I'm hearing beeping elsewhere. Um, basically, why did you change this file? What is the issue that you're working on or the project feature that you're working on? That would have an ID as well. So you can basically have all of these metrics that say, you know, today I worked on the login form. Right, I, I did all the validation, verification, all that fun stuff on the user and their password, but I'm filing it under this issue, which means that once I check it in, this issue is ideally complete, or I'm still working on it, or something like that. Right, so there's progress on the project side of things, not just on the source code. Does the delineation make sense? It's a kid toy. <laughs> Sorry. Think of all these like these requirements, these project proposals that you're working on, um, things that actually make a project structure. Each of these are going to have a milestone tied to it, right? So have I created my login system? Well, yes, here are all of the tasks that I've done in configuration management that say we have made this change, right? And then we can check it off. And this goes into your software processes, right? So if you're going through your spiral model or your waterfall, and we want to release a particular milestone or a particular version number. We can actually iterate through our configuration management system and see have all of our project tasks been checked off, right? Has the code been in, uh, implemented? Has testing been done? Has um, you know system integration been done? Basically, so all these little check marks that you're making go into the the broader process, and that's where kind of this meta overseeing system helps out. We can track things is kind of the key here. So that's the whole purpose of this notion of issues, um, change authorization, configuration management. How do we tie everything together into one neat little bundle? All right, so here I have a slightly blurry figure. Didn't look blurry when I was uh, making the slide. But we have two processes here. They should look very, very similar, other than looking like it was made on a 1960s typewriter. All right, so in blue down here, we have our first development branch. All right, so this let's say this is a set of files. So file A, <clears throat> version X, same as before. I'm going to lock it. I'm going to work on it. Going to change it, check it in, unlock it. We have our little little process right here, right? Now, my coworker in the cubicle next to me also wants to work on it, but they're going to work on a different aspect of this thing, right? So they'll check it out, and then they'll make a branch. So here I might have version one, one dot This could be version one dot one. 
or 0 0.1.1 or whatever your versioning scheme is going to be. Key here is here you have v equals x, here you have v equals y. Okay, so these are different versions. Same file, right? It starts at the same point. So based on whatever state this file is in, when I make a branch, I'm going to have a new version of this file. And then I can do the exact same procedure over here. And then you can branch again and again and again. I would not recommend making too bushy of a tree when you're branching for, for one reason or for multiple reasons, I suppose. But key here is that we can do parallelization of effort, right? People can work on different things at, uh, at the same time. This also gets out of that pesky locking and unlocking problem, which you might have, right? If coworker and I are working on the same feature, and I have it locked, that person can not check it in their changes, right? But if we branch, we can work independently. What are some other reasons that we would have, you know, multiple branches in a project? I kind of gave you the softball easy answer. Let's, let's, you know, paralyze our efforts. What other reasons would we have for something like this? Get a bigger coffee cup. What kind of things would we branch for? Testing a new feature. Actually, good one, yeah. So let's think of this bottom one here as our main line. All right, so this is our base product. Test out a feature and sure will work in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. So testing new features, right? So feature development. That's a great answer, basically. So here we have our main line. This could be our production branch, or our, our main branch would be like our production branch, for instance. Acquiring changes made by others. Yep. So that basically brings in the parallelization efforts. So here we have our main product. Let's throw our feature on this branch. See if it works out okay with our main product line. And then maybe that feature has a feature and that feature has a feature. Sure. So let's try things out on different branches. The only tricky part here, though, is that if this branch keeps iterating, right? So let's say that our base file is... You know, we have a team working on our base development, and then we have a team working on our feature experimental branch or something of that nature, right? If these people are continually updating their project, and you're working on your branch, these changes aren't going to be automatically reflected, right? So if I check in a version on, say, the X branch here, and you check in a version on your Y branch, you have to always look back to the main line to see if there's anything important that has been checked in. And usually you'll get very comfortable with like a diff tool that shows you differences between files. Uh, and if any of you have used like Notepad++ or Sublime, you kind of can get, a, I think, a nice file difference view out of those. Um, but basically, what are the changes and do you want to bring them in? So yeah, we can do that. There's another thing that we can do too, is that let's say that you're working at, I'll use personal experience automotive type company where you have one master code branch for everything, right? So you're developing all of your, say, hardware, and they all have the same basic hardware in them. You just kind of add chips based on what different features you want, okay? So the code base is all the same, but if you're a camera, you go down this branch. If you're a radar, you go down this branch. If you are a radio, go down this branch, right? The chip set's all the same, so all the basic stuff is there. Right? How do you start up this, the system? How do you talk to all the registers and talk to the network and all that? That's all common. All right? So this could be your common source code. And then for whatever particular product flavor you have, you might have a branch. Okay? And then you don't necessarily ever need to merge these back together later on because they're their own separate products. So multiple reasons to version or to branch. It's also possible to go back, right? So let's take the example that you've all been throwing out in the chat here about, say, feature investigation or feature development, right? So I create a branch. I work on my branch until the end of the project or until when I'm done with it. Then it's time to merge back in, all right? So this is what I was kind of alluding to with keeping up with your main line, keeping up with your, your main branch. Um, and... 
in the interim, again, you could have n number of versions. Do the computer science-y kind of thing, right? Make the version number n versions, right? Let's make it symbolic. x, x plus 1, x plus 2, x plus 3, or, you know, 500 git commit IDs in between. Key here is that you, the developer, are going to have to look and see what changes have been made, right? So if I want to merge my feature into x plus 2, I have to make sure that all the changes that were made in between do not conflict with what I added in. Let's say that maybe we start with <clears throat> Unicode encoding, just to pick a completely random feature off the top of my head. So this document's encoded with a certain flavor of text. You're using ASCII or you know, some kind of a, uh, you're investigating other languages support. You might have a different encoding in your document. You bring it back in, you have to make sure that all these lovely features match up. And I'm realizing that my little example probably only holds if you're a Python or a web developer. <laughs> um, the key is that make sure that your changes will work out, I suppose. Uh, merging is not a horrific, terrible thing. Basically, you're just going through and you're merging in changes, making sure your builds still work, making sure everything still works, and then you can merge it back in. But again, you're going to have to merge it with an issue ID or a task, or you're going to have some reason to merge it back in. And that's kind of where we can talk about things like tags or baselines. I mentioned this earlier when we looked at the high level here. So a baseline or a tag or a release candidate, whatever you want to call it, they're basically the same thing. You're getting a snapshot in time. And it only... So the versions between files will be different, <clears throat> right? They're not all going to be v equals 1.0. File A might be, might be the first file. File B might have gone through 30 revisions, right? File C through E might be version 1.x.x.x. .x .x. Okay. So all we care about is the snapshot in time for what all of our files are. <coughs> and again, not just source code. Keep in mind, documents will go through a revision process too. Right, your requirements may have been updated. Your project proposal may have been updated with a new feature that your professor told you to add or to take out because it was too much. Right. So this whole source code package, we can tag it or baseline it. And then we have a nice little set of files which we can identify with the human readable factor. Right. So this is my first release candidate. This is what we sent out to our beta testers. This is the version that we're sending to our product team or our quality team to verify, right? So this is basically your goalpost, your milestone marker in your development process. And you can have as many baselines as you need, right? This is just the state of things at this point in time. Let's say you go down a different development path, right? You want to explore... Go back to the web development example. Right now, we've been doing everything in raw HTML and PHP. Let's explore jQuery for a while to see if we can get a better user experience. Well, we create our milestone, create our baseline. Version 1.0 is our normal web app. 1.1 is going to be the jQuery version. 1.2, we're going to realize jQuery is a bad idea. Let's go to cake PHP. Or, you know, you're basically going to make different snapshots is the point. And if something doesn't work out, you can always go back to a prior milestone. So, yeah, again, this is basically more of the same here. You're going to have a, a big set of these files. You're going to have a big set of these effectively release candidates here. Okay, a question so far. Everybody good? And the kind of the key here is that this is all very generic for you right now, right? This is the high level of configuration management. We are not talking about SVNs, idiosyncrasies, or Git's, you know, specific things they do. Everyone will do their own version. <clears throat> when I was working, we used something called MKS, which is, I think now, I think it's still MKS, but it's like MKS integrity management now, but they had their own way of doing this, right? Every configuration tool is going to have a specific way of doing these things, but the ideas are all the same, right? Enable your team to work on files without 
introducing conflicts, have ways of tying everything together, um, be able to create releases or milestones or whatever the name's going to be, and just you know keep moving forward, right? Something that will this will come back to later on in the semester. We'll talk about things like traceability, which is making sure that everything is linked together, so that you can basically follow breadcrumbs throughout your project to see where things went right or went wrong. This is a big part of it, honestly. All right, so you got the lovely, happy version. We created a release. How does this all work together? All right, so we create a release, create a baseline. We get our release candidate. I'm just throwing random names together. They all mean the same thing, right? Just to get you used to them. So we have a version. What can we do with that version? Well, let's throw it into maybe our build process. So we might have say like a continuous deployment, continuous integration pipelines, like a CI, CD type of thing, where here's our version, make sure that it builds, runs, passes all tests, passes everything. And then out of this process comes a release. Okay. So this could be handled intelligently with something like Travis or Jenkins or, or something of that nature. Or this could be a manual process where you go through, here's talk to your quality team, make sure that you're passing all of your tests. You'd have things like source code reviews with your team, your project team or your management or something like that. Um, you'd go through basically a whole bunch of manual milestones to get through a build procedure, not just building code and making sure it works, right? Uh, joke in programming is that if it compiles, it's good enough. Keep in mind, you have a lot of oversight in this process. Could be manual could be automated. It just depends on your environment. But out of that, let's say that everything works out wonderfully. Let's get a build. Let's get a version, a release. And then this goes into our formal repository. So this is your configuration management repository. Basically, you have a database is all it is. So that's what this kind of um, cylindery thing is, is basically just a database representation. We might have proof as well. So this is going to be your documentation saying you passed all your tests, saying you passed all your verification procedures, that you had all of your source code reviews and everything that you need to check off that everything is okay with the software release. All right, so let me pop back over here. Let's look at, since this is one of the only ones that I can think of off the top of my head, that does a continuous build process. Um, so again, this is that game that I keep telling you guys that I enjoy playing. Um, maddening game, frustrating game, but it's fun to pass five minutes of time as we go. They have this little tag here, and you can actually all do this on GitHub as well. You can hook your code into their continuous build process. So the way this kind of thing works is that every night, a build gets processed or a release gets processed, right? So that's their automated pipeline. This goes through something called Travis CI, where basically it goes through a whole bunch of tests, a whole bunch of compiler checks, right? So here are all of the different compiler flags that get tossed into this particular build. So GCC, Clang, CLang, um, basically all of the different flavors of builds that they support go through an automated process. And what I'm showing you here is that this build is passing all of their unit tests. It's passing all of their, you know, their their build tests, things of that nature. Is this perfect? No, right? So this doesn't have user testing. It doesn't have um, integration testing or any, any kind of like deep, deep testing. But this is basically, does the build work? Does it pass our basic functionalities, things of that nature? This... And pretty little view here. Um, go back here. Do, 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 do. This is your build process, right? Every time we go through a build, we're going to get a version number. So obviously in Git, you're going to get this um, uh, like a long ID. So here's build number 14342. Again, automated process, took an hour to build, or actually, sorry, it took three and a half hours to go through its process. 
but this is a, a formal step. There are tests underpinning this. There are lots of things kind of underpinning that. So point here is that, again, it's not just compile and life is good. It's compile and then go through the rest of it. All right. So we've talked about development config. We even talked about release config. All right. So development config. We're getting our tags, getting our releases, release config. We're actually doing formal releases, formal verifications here. So here's a question to you all, which basically I'm going to talk about here since we're pretty much done with class. I've got a URL here to help you with some of these terms if you want to check it out. So you may hear the terms development config management and release config management. What are the differences? Basically, development is going to be your continuous process. Okay, this is, we are iterating our code, we're working on our code, and we're building like internal releases, right? We're doing internal milestones. Your release configuration management, this is where you have your formal process, where you're going to take everything you've done internally and create a formal release for the client or the customer or something that you want to go through the system as a you know, kind of float along the the river to <laughs> getting poetic now um, to get pushed out to wherever it needs to go later on. Internal, more external is kind of the view that you're taking here. All right. So last but not least, so I kind of want to give you a little bit of a workflow here, and then we will head out. So let's say you have a project with milestones, and you might know these milestones ahead of time, right? So. Actually, you know, let's uh, let's end here, and we'll talk about the rest next time because I feel like this is going to be a five to ten minute chat, probably. Um, does anybody have any questions for today, or any questions on the homework, or anything like that before we go? Or are we all good for the day? Nope. Awesome. Well, I hope you all had a lovely morning, and I will see you all Wednesday. And yeah, nothing exciting from my end, so I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody. I'm giving my Professor Glare Fort Bush. <laughs> Considering you have them built into GitHub. Alrighty, my lovely little box man here. Any of you seen this? Uh, like it's a series of somebody put together Amazon boxes into little robot guys that just look depressed. <laughs> I get a kick out of them. Anyway, we'll see you all next time. <laughs>